We're going to have a little bit of a crowd participation to start out this morning. And I want to talk about our wants, our wants, what we want, just for a moment, and don't, don't like uh, try to overthink this and give a good Sunday school answer or anything like that. Let's just, just, usually your first answer is the right answer, okay? So crowd participation, the first question is, what do you want for lunch? I'm not offering to buy, by the way, but what do you want for lunch? Fried shrimp. Chicken. Pizza. Chicken salad. Just shout it out. It's all right. Sushi. Sushi. <laughs> okay, what about this? Then we ask another question. What do you want, just in general, what do you want for this coming week? Money. Amen. 80 degree weather. Snow. What's that? Peace of mind. Good luck. Sleep. Okay. All right. Let me let me let me ask another one then. Okay. What is your desire or your want for 2015? What did, I'm sorry, what, say it again. Retirement. Retirement. New, beginnings. New beginnings. Sleep. Sleep. <laughs> yeah, rest. Yeah. Okay, here's the last question. If you knew this was the last 24 hours on earth for you, what would you want? Family? Family? Spend time with people you love? Think about that for just a moment. You see, there's something, there's just something about broadening our perspective that helps us see what our heart truly cares about. As you broaden out your perspective a little bit, take the, the, the zoom lens out a little bit and take a look at, at what, what you're looking at, it really changes what our heart truly cares about. The broader our focus, the more real and the more weighty our desires are, it seems. For example, one day last week, I had a very narrow focus, and for about 45 minutes, I was absolutely focused, perhaps even obsessed, with this. A quarter pounder with cheese, the glorious quarter pounder with cheese, from McDonald's, add mayonnaise. Quite possibly the best food item God has ever blessed us with on this face, the face of this earth. <laughs> You see, I hadn't brought my lunch that day, and, and I wasn't able to get away during my normal lunch hours to grab a bite to eat. And so by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I was absolutely starving. And I, I considered my lunch options and thought, okay, I, got, I, just, I, I, can't, I don't have time to go home and fix something. I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm just too hungry. So I got I to gotta grab something on the way home, and I thought, it's got to be a quarter pound of cheese. I've got to get that. That's what I wanted so bad. And that, it, that sandwich, this beautiful sandwich, took a spot front and center in my mind. And, and I started to think about the beef and the cheese and the mayonnaise and, of course, the sweet nectar of heaven to wash it down with Dr. Pepper, to have some of that and to, to wash it down. And it was just, I was, oh, it was such a wonderful thought. And I was so excited about it and so focused. And, and I'll tell you, but by 2.30, though, I couldn't focus on anything else. I had a list of things to do. I had stuff to do at tram. Just noticed tram socks, by the way. And oh, my gosh, everybody's got different <laughs> socks on. Oh, the abuse. Okay, let me back up. Last week I talked about not liking when my girls wear different colored socks. Entire front row here, just so you know, is wearing different colored socks. And the men are rocking the, the pastel colors, and they're, they're looking really good. So, okay. Now, where was I? <laughs> besides undergoing abuse. Okay, so I was, by 2.30, I couldn't focus on anything else. All I could focus on were the different colored socks. No. All I could focus on was this quarter pound of cheese. I had a list of things that I had to do. I had stuff to do for work. I had stuff to do for, for school. And I was on my computer, and all I could think about was the quarter pound of cheese. And so I jumped in my truck, and I made a beeline to Mickey D's to satisfy my craving. And it was as good as advertised, let me tell you. You see, for those 45 minutes, it might have seemed as if the greatest desire in my heart was a cheeseburger. For those 45 minutes, it could have seemed like that was the purpose of my life. I was so focused on that. But you know, in the grand scheme of things, 
as you know, that's not true. If you ask me what my hopes and dreams are for the coming year or for my life as a whole, it'd be pretty messed up if I took a deep breath and said, ah, quarter pounder with cheese, add mayonnaise. This doesn't make sense, does it? No, if you ask for my hopes and dreams for this year, I'm going to talk about some things that are a little more important over the long haul. Finishing my degree, parenting success at home, leading as God has called me to, and things like that. And the reality is that if you consider the brevity of our time on this earth, it gets a little more clear what our heart desires. If you start to think about our short time on this earth, it really kind of filters out everything and helps you focus on what your heart really desires. You know, if I knew this was the last 24 hours on earth for me, I wouldn't worry about quarter pounders with cheese and, and, and finishing my degree and things like that. They're more temporary in nature. I would focus on things that are, that are important, that are, that are eternal in nature. You see, a broadened perspective and a sense of urgency, it really reveals what's in our hearts. And that's why it's so important to pay special attention to today's passage of Scripture. If you have a Bible, open to John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, we find Jesus just hours from his crucifixion. He's given his disciples some final words, some final instructions, and he's stopped to pray. And as soon as he's done praying, we see that he will be arrested and taken off to trial and then subsequently crucified. Now, Jesus' perspective is never broader, nor is his sense of urgency any stronger. In front of him, in his, in, in, right in front of him is the cross, which will serve as the center point of all human history. He knows that what he's about to endure will be the center point of all human history and the point where God's plan can truly come to fruition. And in front of him also is this transition, though. It's a transition from this role of Emmanuel. For the last 30-some-odd years, Jesus had served this role of God with us. He was Emmanuel. And that's what, he's been, that's what he did for that time. He lived and was God with us and gave us an example and showed love. But he's transitioning from Emmanuel to the Lamb of God that will take away the sin of the world. He's transitioning from there to the Lamb of God to the glorified King who will be sitting at the right hand of the Father. And in this moment, we see with great clarity the desire of Jesus' heart. In verses 1 through 5, Jesus prays for God to be with him as he completes the task at hand, asking that, that he will give him the power, the strength, the glory to continue on and to do what this difficult task that God has called him to. And then verses 6 through 19, Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays for God's protection as they enter this crucial time of history to go from the time when Jesus is resurrected to the day of Pentecost to the, the development of the church and to this explosion of Christianity as we know it. He prays for protection for them. And then he spent, I mean, he's, he spent three years discipling, and now it's time to take the training wheels off. But then in verse 20, verse 20 is where he starts praying for us. This is what he says. My prayer is not for them alone. I also pray for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given, given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and I will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I'm sure you've heard this passage before. It's... Uh, it's kind of popular, particularly in our movement, our restoration movement. And it's, isn't, it, isn't it interesting that with the scope of eternity in Jesus' eyes, with no broader perspective, that in that moment and with the sense of urgency of the cross before him, the cross being within arm's reach of Jesus, that he prayed for us and he prayed for unity. Let's consider some of the characteristics of this unity that Jesus prayed for. In verse 21, Jesus said that all of them may be one. And the question we have to ask, I think, is who is all of them? Who is he talking about? 
When Jesus said that all of them may be one, and we learn in the verse prior that Jesus is talking about those who will believe in me through their message. The mes- their message being the message of the disciples who will then uh, take the power that Christ has given them through the power of the Holy Spirit in the day of Pentecost and then go and preach the gospel and spread the good news across the world to which, point, of course, disciples will be making disciples who make disciples. And then pretty soon in 2015, here we are. So those who will believe in me through their message. And so therefore the people Jesus is talking about is every man, woman, and child who believes in Christ because of hearing the gospel. Because it's filtered down from the, from the original 11 disciples, and then you added Paul as an apostle, and you've got all this, and it filters down, as I said, to 2015, to this place, and to places all over the world. And so, again, Jesus is talking about every man, woman, and child who has come to Christ because of hearing the gospel. And let me tell you a little secret. We ain't the only church that's got some of those animals. We're not the only one. I, I, I think you probably know that. Oh, I hope that you're glad about to know that we are not the only ones that have believed because of the message. I'm reminded of a story Jeff Walling told about his understanding of who all of them might include. He said early in his life he had figuratively drawn a circle on the ground with a piece of chalk, and that, that small circle represented uh, the people that he thought would get to go to heaven. And he said as he, as he grew in his faith and as he matured and he got older, he, he decided that maybe his circle was a little too small. And so he, he drew a little bit bigger circle and, and included a few more people. And he said, then I continued, even later in life, he realized that, that this circle was much big. And so he took his figurative chalk and he drew a huge circle and said, this is the people that are going to get into to, to heaven. And he was somewhat pleased with himself and, and thinking, you know, how proud God would be of him that he kept uh, expanding the circle and he made it so big. And, but he still struggled with his circle and who was included in it and who was excluded in it. And so he prayed, God, you know, should I make the circle even bigger? And Jeff said that God said to him, give me the chalk. <laughs> give me the chalk. It's not, it's not me who decides. It's not me who draws the circle and says, if you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. That's not me. God says, I want the chalk. I'll be the, the judge of that. When Jesus prayed for all of them, it includes those of us in this room, as well as those of, of people in rooms all over this city right now, and all over this state, and all over this nation, and people who are meeting across, overseas, not even meeting in a room perhaps. It includes all of them, all over the world who believe in Jesus. And he prayed that we would all be one. Let me take a little poll here by a show of hands. How many of you do your best to keep different foods separate on your plate when you eat? Raise your hand. And how many of you just mix it all together? We have a name for you, weirdos. (laughs) If I had my way, I would uh, have a plate like this every single meal. (laughs) I want my stuff separate. I don't want my food mixed in fact, uh, I go to breakfast at IHOP on a regular basis, and I ask them. I get to uh, always get pancakes with uh, hash browns and eggs with some bacon and tomato mixed in, and I always ask for my pancakes on a different plate because mixing my syrup with my hash browns is just against God's will, I believe. I just don't think it's right. It's disgusting. And I, and I think, you know, I hate it when, when certain foods mix, but I really think that probably we've often treated other believers the way I've treated my food. And here's our nice church plate, and you belong over here, and I belong over there, and here you can go in this compartment, and I'll go in this compartment. But Jesus said, you know, I want them to all be on the same plate. <laughs> Not only do I want them to all be on the same plate, I want them mixed together. That's how I want. I want them to be one. And as much as I hate mixing food, something crazy happened a few months back. It was a Sunday morning. I was working on uh, you know, finishing up my sermon and stuff, and, and my daughter Riley was making her some breakfast, and, she, and mom said, hey, why don't you ask Dad if he, want, he wants you to make uh, him some breakfast too. And so Riley came in. She goes, Dad, I'm, I'm making some breakfast. Do you want some breakfast? And I said, sure. What are my options? And she said, what do you want? I said, what are my options? She said, well, do you want uh, cereal or toast or eggs? And being the smart aleck that I was, I said, Yes. She said, well, which one? I said, yes. 
I went back to work and didn't think anything about it or whatever. And then just a few minutes later, here comes Riley with a plate, with a piece of toast, an egg on the toast, and cereal scrambled into the eggs. <laughs> now, here's the game. I, I got to eat it. I, I got I to act like that's exactly what I wanted. And so I lifted this thing up, and it looked really disgusting, and I thought, well, here goes nothing. And I took a bite, and she's there staring at me, wondering what's going to happen. And you know what? It wasn't half bad. <laughs> and you know what? Riley fixed my breakfast several times after that, and I'd probably say seven or eight more times, I asked, I asked for that. Try it sometime. It's got to be like, not like Fruit Loops or anything like that. I, maybe, I don't know. I haven't tried it, but uh, you know, I, I really liked it. I thought, you know, I never would have ever thought that toast and egg and cereal all together would have been any good. And it, w- it was actually pretty good. And I think what happens is that Jesus, he knew that while we might have a tendency to keep one another in different compartments, that there's nothing sweeter than all believers together in one dish. That's what he wants. For us. That's what is on his heart. Then he continues in verse 21. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. And in this, Jesus identifies the perfect model for this unity that he prays for, this unity of believers. And the perfect model is the Trinity. We call it the Holy Trinity. Jesus specifically mentions the Father and the Son, but we can certainly take into account the Holy Spirit as well. And and, uh, uh, as Ken said today, you have to understand that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they are different. They're different. Consider how they're different. I think probably the best way, the, the, the biggest two ways that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are different are personality and action. Who what their person is and what they do and what they've done. And you've got the Father who is reigning from heaven, who is the source of will, who is the one that we we bring our prayers to. And and you've got the Son who was God with us, and he came to this earth, and he took his cues from the Father for the glory of the Father. And of course, what Jesus did is he made way for the Holy Spirit to come, and he lives inside us. And so you've got different personalities, different locations, different, different purposes of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And of course, that's a gross oversimplification, but you can see that, that each of the three Three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they're, they're, they're unique. They're different. However, even though they are different, they are still one. They are, they, they are one, first of all, in essence. They are one in essence in that they are all God. I think probably a couple of the examples that I love to use to help explain the Trinity is the one that you've heard, probably heard of water. That you've got water, you've got uh, H2O is the chemical makeup for water, and you've got, uh, uh, whether it's a liquid, a solid, or a gas, three different forms, all still water. So the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all different forms, but still all God. They're, they're one in essence. And another one I really like, too, it's a little different, is, is the egg. I love the egg example, you know, that you've got, uh, you don't really have an egg unless you have the shell and the white and the yolk. And each of those three have different purposes and do different things and have, have different forms, but they're all together, they make the egg. And so you've got the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit different, but all together they make God. And so they're one. They are one in essence, but they are also one in other things too. They are one in mind. That everything, they're, 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 all their thoughts are congruent. They're on the same wavelength. They're, they're, their thoughts and their ideas and everything, they're not different from one another. They're completely and totally on the same page, more than you could ever imagine. Another way that they're, they're one is they're one in effort, that they all work together for the same purpose. Even though they have different roles in the redemption of all mankind, they're all working together for that goal. And then, of course, they're all one in purpose, as I said, that they, the redemption of all creation, that's their goal, that's their purpose. And so they may be different in location, personality, purpose, whatever the case may be, but they are all one in essence. They are one in mind. They are one in effort and one in purpose. And this is the example that Jesus gives us. He says, I want them to be one like we are one. I want them to have the same kind of unity that the Father has with the Son and the Son has with the Holy Spirit, and, 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 and that together they are one. And in the same way, so we, we may be different in personality, we may be different in location. We may be different in other ways that make us unique, but we can, we can be one. We will be one when we are also one in essence. 
You know, it says here that, we, you know, uh, Jesus said, I pray that, that they all be one, those who have heard my, the message and, and believe in me. In essence, that's what unites us. Christ is what unites us, the good news of Jesus. We are all saved by the grace of God. So essentially, that's what unites us. But also, just as the Trinity are, are one in mind and effort and purpose, we too, as Jesus prayed, should be one in mind, that our thoughts are congruent with one another, that our, our, our efforts work together to achieve, achieve the same purpose. And so we have unity in those things. And then Jesus says how this unity is possible. Verse 22. He said, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. i got to be honest with you, I, I don't know if I ever caught that verse before. I've read it a thousand times, but I don't think I, until I prepared for this sermon, I hadn't really caught what he was saying there. I have given them the glory that you gave me. Now, I don't know about you, but that word glory, it, it, I don't know, it's a little sticky. I mean, obviously it means uh, greatness, it means splendor, it means radiance, it means majesty. And all of these are words that I associate with Jesus, particularly the Jesus that we read about in Revelation, the glorified, majestic King of kings and Lord of lords. The problem is, is that I don't, I'm not the King of kings. I don't have majesty. I don't have that kind of glory. I don't think Jesus has given me that. But in Revelation 5, you know, we see actually the way the battle was won. In spite of the fact that Jesus is, is, uh, is portrayed in the book of Revelation as this conqueror, this king of kings, this majest majestic being, we actually see how the battle was won in Revelation 5. In the first verses of Revelation 5, we find John weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and fulfill God's will for all creation. But then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, it says this. It says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion, the tribe of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seas and so, seals. And the, so the elder says here in heaven, he says, hold up now. Don't cry anymore because we have the king. We have the majesty. We have the lion of Judah, and he is triumphant. And then we have verse 6. Right after that, we talked about this when we studied through Revelation. Verse 6 then I saw a lamb looking as, it is, as if it had been slain. The elder says, we've got this majestic being. We've got the conqueror. He's triumphant. And here's how John describes him as what he saw was a lamb. Now, I don't know if you've been around sheep very often, but a lamb, particularly one that's been slaughtered, is not very triumphant looking. You see, I think we think glory, I think we most often think of the triumphant Lord with the, the sword coming out of his mouth and the, the, the hair and the eyes of fire and all these different things that we get, and then, you know, the, the booming voice, and rightfully so, because that is the Christ we serve. But the Christ that we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, church, that Christ is no less glorious. No less glorious. This humble servant this friend of sinners, this selfless sacrifice, the epitome of who Jesus was while on this earth is just as glorious. Because that's how the battle was won. With lamb power. With sacrifice by Jesus giving his life on the cross for our sins in humility, as we was read earlier in Philippians, that, that didn't consider equality with God something to hold on to, but he gave himself, he emptied himself. That's how the battle was won. And so church, when, when Jesus says that he gave uh, the glory that the Father gave him to us, what he is saying is that through his sacrifice, through his death and resurrection, we are able to be just like Jesus. He's given us the ability to become like him and to have that glory that he showed on this earth, the glory of holiness that can only come through Christ, the glory of humility, selfless, caring, compassionate. Everything we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in regards to Jesus' character is available to us through what Jesus did. And guess what? If all of us started to look like that, you can bet that we're going to be unified. If all of us start to look like Jesus looked and have the character that Jesus had in the Gospels, I can promise you that we are not going to have to worry about unity anymore. 
It's just going to happen. Then Jesus shares an important purpose, though, for unity in, in the second part of verse 23. He says, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. You see, we must never forget that Jesus identified our unity with mission. That he absolutely coupled and interlocked unity with mission. Unity is not there just so we can get along. It's not there just so we can have peace in the church. It's not just there so we can have it for our own benefit. Jesus prayed that we might have unity so that the world will know. And and so the world will know two things. He prayed that we would have unity so the world would know two things. First of all, the Son's mission. The Son's mission. He said that that I want to pray that they have unity so that the world will know that you have sent me. So the world will know that Jesus was sent to be the sacrifice for our sins, to be the Savior for us, to to, to save us from our sins, to give us eternal life, but also to give us full life on this earth if we only take upon his character, upon ourselves, allow God to transform us. So that's the first thing, the Son's mission. Jesus prayed we might have unity so the world will know his mission, but also so that they'll know God's love. They'll know God's love. He said that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So people will see the love of God in those things, as we are unified, as we act out our unity, as we act out our love. And so Jesus prayed that we'll have unity so that the world will know the Son's mission and so that the world will know God's love. I like how D.A. Carson put it. He said, This display of unity is so compelling, so unworldly, that their witness as to who Jesus is becomes explainable only if Jesus truly is the revealer whom the Father has sent. In other words, what he's saying is that Man, there are so many factions and, and divisions in this world. And if, if the church, if God's people, all believers, are only simply one as God has called them to be, as Jesus prayed for us to be, then the only explanation to the world is going to be that this is God. That's the only explanation that can make any sense. You see, we live in a world that's covered in little bitty chalk circles that mark boundaries for, between people for various reasons. You see it every day in your life. We, there are boundaries that are that's us, them, you, and me, and it's you know, Republican and Democrat or black and white or old and young or for and against or in and out, whatever the case may be. But when believers who certainly represent the most diverse crowd of people, by the way, on the face of the earth, when all believers who, who represent the most diverse group of people ever known to mankind, when they are unified, when they are together, There could be no other explanation other than it's a God thing. See, what we see in this passage, it's a glimpse into the heart of Christ. It's the desire of Christ that that all believers, all believers are one. And they're all one by following the model of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit being one in essence and being one in in mind and, and, and effort and purpose. And that we can do that by taking on the glory of Christ, the character of Christ, and and we, all, we do all that, not just for our own benefit, but so that the world will know. And so the question of this sermon series and the question of this sermon is, what if he meant it? What if Jesus really meant what he prayed? What if he meant it? Well, I think there's a couple of things that I think that we should do to put this into action and bring joy to the heart of Christ. If Jesus really meant what he prayed, then it's got to mean something to us. And here's a couple of things that I think it should mean to us. First of all, I think we need to acknowledge our extended family. Acknowledge our extended family. I confess to you that this is an area of rehabilitation for me. It's an area of rehabilitation, something I've struggled with. You see, because the churches have put so much emphasis on attendance and things like that as a measure of success, what has happened is that we've taken on almost a business model that we're trying to to attract people here. And we say, okay, if we just do better this, you have a better preacher, have a better youth group, have a better worship time, whatever the case would be, or the biggest uh, VBS or the best uh, outreach events or whatever the case would be, that we can just draw people here. And we put such an emphasis on how many people are sitting in our, our pews on a Sunday morning and how many bucks are in our offering plate, how how the state of our buildings, if we're building buildings, we put so much emphasis on that, it has done nothing more than to turn 
churches into competitors. Are you going to shop at Walmart or are you going to shop at Target? That's the question. Are you going to go to Christ Covenant Church or are you going to go to another church? And what happens is when you turn churches into competitors, church leaders who have been doing this all, almost all their adult life, they start looking at other preachers and other youth ministers as competition. They start looking at them as the enemy. And jealousy and bitterness and things like that developed. And, it, and, it, and it's not just that we viewed churches as competitors, but we've also made it an us versus them situation in regards to other believers as well. We've, we've taken that chalk and we've, we've, we've made little lines on the, on the, on the, on, in the sand or on the, we've drawn circles on the concrete or we've taken our, our cafeteria trays and we've put them all in different places. You know, we dunk people when we baptize and they sprinkle. Or we allow everybody to participate in communion. You have to go through kind of a, a membership thing. or you have, to have a, you have to carry your membership card to do it. Or, you know, we've governed ourselves and they have to answer to the regional bishop. Or, you know, we have a guitar and they have an organ and they don't have any instruments. And on and on and on and on. And we start dividing up the churches based on these things. Now, I'm not saying that doctrine and theology is not important. And obviously, we care very much about vision and structure of what our church activity should look like. That's something we take very seriously as church leaders. Very seriously. But there are two things that I've learned over the last 19 years of ministry. First thing is, the more I learn, the less I realize I know. The more I learn, the less I realize I know. I know. And I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a better theologian now than I ever have been in my life, simply because I've been doing it for so long. And you know what I know? I know I don't really know it all. There's a lot that I do not know. And I realize that all theology is man-made. And the doctrine is subject to our own view of Scripture. That I cannot escape my own perspective when I study the Scripture. And everything I study, everything I develop, everything I decide is true is affected by my imperfection. <laughs> And while we should strive to accurately interpret and apply the Bible in our lives and, to, in, and in our church... I, I am thankful that the Bible says that uh, everyone who has accepted Christ, actually, the Bible doesn't say, that everyone who has accepted Christ is going to get into heaven on that day of judgment after their names are in the book of life and after they pass the theology test. Aren't you glad about that? That you don't have to have it all perfectly figured out before you are accepted and brought in by Christ? And so I think, I think a little theological and hermeneutical humility is in order when we're dealing with other Christians. To, to just to say, you know what? I think this is the way it is, but I could be wrong. It's happened before. But the other thing I realized is that this is what Jesus said in John 13, 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus said our defining characteristic that will identify us as Christians is Love. He didn't say, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if your theology is pristine. That's how they're going to know that you're really Jesus followers if your theology is good. He didn't say, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if your doctrine is perfect. He didn't say, uh, by this everyone will know you are my disciples if you do church the right way. That's not what he said. Yet those are, seem to be sometimes the things that we strive after more in love. He said, they'll know you're my disciples. Your defining characteristic is not how you do church. It's not what you believe. It's not whether you act exactly the way you're supposed to and follow all of the, you know, dot the, the I's and cross the T's. It's love. Do you love one another? And so I think we should acknowledge that the church next door and down the street is a gathering, an extended gathering of our family. That's our family. We should acknowledge that the believer in our workplace and the believer in our classroom is one of us. And then we should love one another. You see, I think the mission field that God has placed us in is way too rough for us to be making enemies by some false standard. This mission field that we are in is too rough and tumble for us to be trying to fight battles over theology and doctrine and church structure. It just doesn't make any sense. Instead, we should join together and be there for one another. Imagine for a second. Let's, let's just imagine this for a second. Let's imagine that, that um, you find yourself in a foreign land. 
Let's say that you wake up in the morning and you realize that you are in Tehran, Iran. You're by yourself. Okay, this is a bad thing, right? Because you probably, I don't think anybody here knows that speaks whatever the Iranian language is. And you, you find yourself smack dab in the middle of Tehran and you don't know where you are. You don't know where you're going. You're in the midst of a people that, that are skeptical at you of, uh, of you at best and perhaps even see you as a threat in their presence. But even if you did want to try to get help and try to get out of there, you couldn't. You're out of luck because you can't speak the language. You, can't, you don't know how to talk to people. You don't know how to communicate with people. And, and, and so you're wandering through the streets, and you're trying to figure out what to do, and you're hungry, and you're intimidated, and you're scared even. But in the midst of the city, you hear a voice. You hear a voice, and while you don't recognize that voice, you do realize that that person is speaking English. And so what happens is you hear this person speaking English, and not only are they speaking English, but it's someone that sounds just like Donna Kay. It's someone with a big, thick Texas accent. And so you run towards the sound of this voice, and you're excited, and you turn a corner, and you see there, you see two people standing there, and they're, they got their cowboy hat, their boots on, their cowboy hat, and they're, they're holding an H-E-B grocery bag, and they're eating a Waterburger. And, and you, you, man, you've got to be thinking about how excited you are. I mean, don't you, th- don't you think you're going to be excited and relieved that there's someone there that you can relate to, someone there that, that's from where you're from? And you run up there to them because and, and you, 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 you're so excited about this. But, but wait, as you get closer, your heart sinks because you look up and they're wearing a blue shirt with a silver star on the front. And you realize that they are a Dallas Cowboy fan. (laughs) And you yourself are an avid Houston Texan fan. And you can't be associating with those type of people. So you turn around and you'd much rather starve and die in Tehran or Ann on your own than to hang out with those people. Sounds kind of ludicrous, doesn't it? Sounds ludicrous. No, the, the, the more likely result is you're going to run up to those people. You're going to throw your arms around them and say, I am so happy to see you. And yeah, you might get into a spirited discussion about whether the Cowboys or Texans are better, but you're still going to work together. You're still going to be there in support of one another. You're still going to have a relationship with these people, trying your best to get along in a world that you don't fit into, in a world that, that, that you're not comfortable in, in a world that you just don't know a whole lot about. And so, you see, though, that, that, that's how we should react when we encounter brothers and sisters in Christ in this world. But way too often, I think we, we hear a fav- familiar voice and, and we run out to someone only to dismiss them because they don't believe exactly what we believe or their church doesn't work like our church does. And we walk up and we, we see, oh, somebody familiar. Oh, wait, your, your shirt says Baptist. Uh, no. Oh, you're a Methodist. Oh, you're a cat. Oh, what, what is, oh, sorry. You just, it doesn't fit. I can't, I can't be with you. No, that's not how it should be. Instead, I mean, yes, guess what? Just like you're going to argue about Dallas Cowboys versus the Texans, you're probably going to argue about, uh, have a spirited discussions about beliefs and theology and church structure. And that's okay. As long as there's love in it. But that should not keep us from working together for the benefit of one another and for the benefit of God's kingdom. And that all starts by acknowledging our extended family. But the second thing we need to do, if Jesus really meant this, is we need to work with our family so the world can see. Work with our family. And by our family, I mean not also the extended family, but, but us, our, our family. Back in college, my wife Carrie was sitting uh, in a cafeteria uh, eating, eating supper with some of her friends, and a friend of a friend came and joined the group, and she started going on and on about this professor. She said, Dr. Malman is just a pain in my rear end, and he's just unfair, and he's not, he's not good. He's not, I mean, he's just a jerk, and I just don't like him. And uh, what the girl didn't realize is that my wife, who's now named Carrie Beard, her name at the time was Carrie Malman. And it just so happened that this Dr. Malman that this girl was trashing was her father, Carrie's father. And it was her friend that said, uh, don't you know that that's her dad? And, and can you imagine how awkward it was to be in that situation? 
You see, if Jesus really meant what he said, then, then when people see the family of God working together, it will get their attention, and it will serve as evidence of God's mission through Christ and God's love for us. Unfortunately, just like that clueless girl trashing Carrie's dad, the world around us doesn't really know that we are family, let alone that we are unified. Church, you may have heard me say in the past that fulfilling God's mission is a team sport. You heard me say that? That, that doing mission is a team sport. That's something that we're doing. We need to do, do it together. We're not meant to be disciples of and missionaries for Christ by ourselves. We are not meant to do this alone. And in the past, I've said this due in great part to the fact that, that I want to encourage you. That, and I think sometimes we make it harder than we have to. That We think we're lone rangers out there. That, and we've, as a church, I think we've even made this a reality in your life that you're supposed to go out and you're supposed to go do mission. Go do it. And if you're not doing it, you're not doing it right. But the truth is that we're all in this together. It's not you go, it's we go. And that's what we should do. We should be encouraged by that. But here's the other thing we need to, to realize. Working for the, together for the sake of one another and the sake of God's kingdom is not just helpful for us. It is vital for those who need Jesus. Do you realize that? that I'm not just telling you, hey, you're not in this alone. You need to do this together. I'm not just saying that because uh, I want you to, to be comfortable and, and have a team to, to work with. I'm saying that because according to Jesus, that is vital to people who need him. To see the church family, to see believers working together. You see, if Jesus really meant what he prayed, then we have work to do. And it's time for us to do our part in bringing unity to all believers by following the model of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, by taking on the character of Christ that the world might know. And it all starts with us in this room and the other followers of Jesus that we come in contact with every day. A couple of weeks ago, my friend Janice Trammell, she sent me a a thought of the day. She, she does that on a regular basis. Just a thought of the day from something she's read. And, and this is the thought that, that she sent that day. It was, snowflakes don't amount to much individually, but when they cooperate, they can shut down a freeway. And if you're in southeast Texas, it only takes three snowflakes. <laughs> but isn't that true? The snowflakes don't amount to much individually, but when they cooperate, they can shut down a freeway. I like that. But not only that, not only can they shut down a freeway, they can beautifully transform a landscape like this. Like this. There it is. Isn't that pretty? When they work together, they can take a dingy, dirty street and, and, and old, leafless trees in the wintertime, and they can make it beautiful. In church, if, if we work together, we can make this world a beautiful place too. And not only that, but when snowflakes cooperate, they can also provide the surface for an exciting and thrilling ride, something like this. And that's what we can do. So little snowflakes, it's time for us to get to work and act like Jesus meant it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we uh, ask for your forgiveness for those times that we have placed chalk barriers around ourselves to keep others out. And we pray, Lord, that you'll help us to see your desires, not just for the unity of this congregation, but for the unity of all believers. Lord, help us to do our part. Help us to acknowledge and engage our extended family. God, I pray for the success of other churches in this town. I pray that you will have such growth in this community for your kingdom that can only be attributed to you and that, that maybe, just maybe, we can be a part of that, God, but if not, if we don't get the credit, if our name is not on it, that you still are glorified. And Lord, I pray that you will bless everyone in this area, in this community, in this town, in this, this state that loves you has come to know you and to believe in you through the message of the gospel. And I pray you'll help us to, to become one with those people. But God, I also pray that you'll help us to get rid of the sins of individualism and isolation and, and reconnect with our church family right here in this community, right here in this church. And that we engage this world in such a way that people see that we are family and see 
that we are unified. And I pray, Lord, that all of that will be modeled after the unity that you share with the Son and the Holy Spirit. I pray we do that. As we do that, we'll increase our character to look more like Jesus. And I pray that we do that all so that the world may know. God, thank you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing.